Welcome back to Revolutionary Health, part two of our Doctors Roundtable with Dr. Mel Branch, Dr. Leo, and Dr. Q. As always, make sure you follow us on our social media, Facebook and Instagram at The Counter Narrative, Twitter at Building Desire. I want to switch gears, though, and unfortunately, we are still in COVID-19, and Miss Rona is still lurking around here. And there's news of a COVID-19 vaccine and different uh, remedies that may be coming down the pipeline. And I myself don't trust it. Um, I still feel like it's a little bit too soon to come on down here um, uh, to, to inject anything in my body. Um, but when it comes to COVID-19, a lot of information, like I said before, that we're getting from these different sources, why do you think with Black people specifically that we don't really trust that a COVID-19 vaccine or anything uh, may work right now in this time? At least I should make an I statement. I take that back. I don't trust uh, that the COVID-19 vaccine at this point would be a useful decision for me and my health. I'm going to change that to an I statement. <laughs> I I think it's because COVID is so new and we just really truly don't understand everything about it. If you know, if you look at when, you know, the first coronavirus cases were coming out, there was this theory floating around that, oh, I haven't heard of any black people with corona. So right. black people aren't getting it. And then as the cases started to increase and you saw the number of hospitalizations and complications, it shifted from that, oh, black people aren't getting corona. No, black people are dying from it. So it, was, it became a that whole conversation. And then it's, it's now switching gears to talk about prevention. It's kind of like, as black people, where do you fit in on that? At first, we weren't getting it. Now we're the highest group of people who are getting it. Mm-hmm. And now we're talking about coming out with the vaccine. And it's like, well, where do I fit in in this? Now, this is one of those things where it's a lot of you know, misunderstanding and misinformation. And I think, you know, the media for all its good usefulness, it's kind of gotten to a point where it's all about clickbait now and where headlines and articles really don't focus on the the hard hitting facts. At least from, in my opinion, we're at least a year away from a vaccine. So this idea of talking about vaccines, I think it's more so the research component of trying to find a vaccine that works which is a different conversation, but an important conversation when it comes to black people in clinical trials. So this idea of the vaccine coming and injecting people with it, and they're talking about, you know, XYZ candidate is a good vaccine candidate. I think we're at least in my opinion, you know, I could be wrong, a year or so away from actually having something that works. But I feel that, you know, to kind of take away from that headline that mentioned that, you know, for a coronavirus vaccine to work, it's going to need black people. I think the headline was just completely unrelated. It was a horrible headline. Horrible. Right? Because if you actually read the article, what it was saying was that in order to find a vaccine that works, you're looking at the people that are at most risk and you need a broad and diverse group of people to see if whatever you're looking at has either a positive effect or a negative effect. And I think that was the important part of all clinical trials you want a, a equally diverse group of you know participants but i think the headline was just so misleading that it really kind of threw the entire conversation off its, off the off the track it threw me the hell but, off i was like <laughs> no i'd like to to add to that I, you know one of the things that also occurred during this time is either due to the limited availability of tests or some of the bias uh, that we were seeing there are people, particularly black people and other people of color, who went to get testing and were denied testing, you know, and then ultimately were positive for COVID, some died, you know. So we have to also keep in mind that those stories are shared, those stories are seen, you know, and then you want to turn around and tell me now you are working on a vaccine and you want to, you know, put that vaccine into my body after you wouldn't even test me for this virus, you know? So we really have to have to think about how all of those, those things affect people's comfort level and their distrust of the system, you know? 
Yeah, we're good. We're good enough to be tested on for a vaccine, but we weren't good enough to be either either tested or hospitalized. Even when we had symptoms, you told us to just go home and wait it out. And then a lot of us died. And so mm -hmm. it is problematic. And I think it's a it's a balance between this thing of we don't want to be experimented on, but then we want representation. And there is a balance there. So you have to be able to find it. But the medical profession is so crappy about how it treats black people. And it's always humorous to me when you know, the medical staff and, you know, organizations were making statements after George Floyd and medical people were sitting, you know, kneeling for eight minutes and 30 some odd seconds in honor of George Floyd. And I was like, y'all don't need to be doing that and protesting law enforcement. Y'all need to be doing better about the racism in the medical profession. That's what you mm -hmm. need to be working on. This knee stuff and just taking a gesture or writing it's out. Some yeah, it's yeah. That's, that's all it was. And, and are saying like, we, we object to law enforcement people doing this. Uh, you know, you can't object to that if you're practicing the same continuum of that racism in your own space. Work on your own space first uh, and then move from there. I'm not usually a stay in your lane person, but this is kind of a <laughs> stay in your lane moment for me. Like, focus on, on the ivory tower that you currently work in. Let's start there. Let's even think about the way you treat your black residents. Like, let's, you know, before we even get, I mean, start with the people that you're training. Like, treat them better. Treat the patients that you see better. Um, dismantle these system, systems that are oppressing your patients and the people you're training. But <laughs> No, I think that's a very important discussion to bring in um, as well, because I saw you, Dr. Mel Branch, talk about that, like um, addressing the racism within the medical profession as well. Because I myself have experienced that as a black gay man where I'm like, automatically when I'm coming and presenting in an office, you automatically assume X, Y, and Z about myself. And that's not even why I'm in here, you know? So, so I, I thank you all for bringing that discussion in, in there. And like I say, even when it comes to a clinical trial or anything with COVID-19, I myself don't feel comfortable. I would love to further science and love to help science, but y'all ain't about to put that in my body right now. Like yeah. I hear different things all the time with it. So just hypothetically looking toward the future, and I hate hypothetical questions, but I'm going to ask one. But looking toward the future when it comes to COVID-19 um, and getting Black people in clinical trials, do you feel within our population that more people might be apt to sign up for a clinical trial or want to further science in that way? And if not, are there solutions that we can probably look at? I'm sorry, Dr. Yes. <laughs> You saw Q? Q was Q was queuing up, and so I want to start with Q. Thank you. Uh -oh. <laughs> Q was queuing up. Come on, Q. It, it is so difficult. And, you know, the thing is, uh, David tells me this all the time. I always present myself as just the community clinician. So what I do is I'm taking care of people in the community. I'm not heavily involved in research. You know, I'm not in these decision-making positions. But I keep myself abreast of it. And so to those who are watching, in developing these clinical trials and coming up and recruiting people for clinical trials, you have to include people who look like us. Not in the, in the lab and not only in the lab, but also in the community. I think you know part of that, one of the most difficult things, and it's a interesting thing going on in Georgia right now, specifically around COVID-19 and contact tracing. Contact tracing is important to controlling this disease process and in controlling you know, coronavirus in the US. However, when you're looking at the communities that are hardest hit, currently in the state of Georgia, Fulton and Gwinnett County, Fulton County you know, has a significant number of people of color and black people you know, Gwinnett County has a significant Hispanic and Latino population. If the people who are doing the contact tracing don't look like them, they're not giving up any information. So when it comes to clinical trials, if the person that you're talking to about informed consent and understanding what's going on in the trial, if it does, if they don't look like the person that you're trying to enroll, they're not going to enroll. But also on the flip side, those people who are conducting the clinical trials also need to look like us. Right. Because when you look at you know, all of the information that's coming out, the people who are leading these conversations on you know, COVID-19, 
don't really look like the communities that are the hardest hit. So it is one of those things where as that community clinician taking care of people, it is an important role, but it's also to those people who are in our academic and research institutions, you know, you have to include people from the communities that you're trying to serve. And I and think that's they a, that's not a only must. need to... <laughs> Sorry about that. I think they not only need to look like like us, but they actually need to also care about us because just because they look like us doesn't mean that they, you know, really have our best interests at heart. And, you know, as I was going back and doing some more reading around the Tuskegee syphilis study, and I know that, you know, we're not focusing there, um, the American Medical Association, the National Medical Association, uh, yes. which is, you know, the black body of, of uh, physicians, you know, also supported that study, right? So, yeah. so if you have people who look like us that have historically also supported unethical research, then just because, you know, the person looks like us doesn't mean that, that they're going to be seen as trustworthy. So I think they have to care about us and be wanting to truly connect with the community. I think there are some amazing people that are doing this work right now, like Dr. Stefan Wallace, I think is a great example. You know, someone that, that is involved in the study design and involved in the rollout. You know, I think all of those pieces, um, someone who's going to speak up about the way in which we're trying to, um, to reach the community and not just as numbers, um, you know, but also uh, informing and, and to really get the right people into the trial to get the best, um, the clearest and uh, most definitive research that we can. There was a study that came out a couple of years ago in the National Bureau of Economic Research where they created a clinic, a mock clinic, and looked at hundreds of patients. This was in California, all black men, and they split them up to either see a black male physician or an Asian or a white male physician and assessed how willing they were to do preventive health measures like colonoscopies, um, checking for diabetes, that kind of stuff. And they went into it and then they had their experience with the clinician and then they actually saw or evaluated what preventive measures they would be willing to do after meeting with the clinician. And they found that it was statistically significant that those participants, those patients that saw a black, another black male doctor were much more likely to be receptive to preventive health services, even if they involved needles and invasive procedures. They were more than the white and Asian doctors. And so what they concluded that, and they also did some qualitative stuff and they asked them some questions about what the experience was. And they said a lot for the white and Asian doctors that they were kind of, you know, they got the task done, they asked the appropriate questions. When they used the words, when they discussed the black male physician, I felt comfortable. He really expressed some concern. He was care. He was caring. There were much more kind of um, feel good descriptors that were given to the black male doctors by the patients that were. And they concluded in saying, yes, we need more of us there. And so representation does matter. Race does matter. You can still be a good clinician and treat black patients if you're not black. But there is a connection that happens and we cannot deny it. And like Leo and Cubo said, it, that has to be the starting point. Um, and once you get to there, that we're at the table, that we're initiating these studies, that we're conducting the studies, and everybody that's reaching out to the community is part. And we're not hard to find. So all the people that say, well, I couldn't find uh, a, an academic physician or an MD, PhD to do that, that's a bunch of bullshit. There are tons of qualified black and brown people out there. You're just not looking hard enough, or you just don't give them the chance. And I think the hardest dismantling of white supremacy will be within those systems that they're so used to scratching each other's backs and funding each other that they actually give the qualified ones of us that are out there doing the work, give us a chance, and then they'll see the difference that it makes. Um, but they have to be willing to let go of that control. And that's where the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. Come on. I appreciate you three so much. I always walk away feeling so much better about health and doctors <laughs> with talking to you three. I really do. I love this conversation so much. And we've covered a lot. But I just want to end it like always um, here um, as, we, as we get out of here. What is one thing that we should know about you or anything else that's going on right now before we close the show? Dr. Q? <laughs> I see you down there. Come on. Um, I just think at least, well, nothing about me personally or even professionally. I just think people really should, you know, 
pay attention to themselves and take care of yourselves. Wash your hands and wear a mask. <laughs> that looks that, like a Beyonce. Does that have the Beyonce pink lettering on it? Yeah. It does. So I see you for that. I see you. Come on, Juneteenth. Beyonce, yes. Her black Dr. parade <laughs> that video <laughs> last night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dr. Leo, what should we know about your YouTube show? Give it to us one more time and one thing that people should take away from it. Uh, definitely. It's called uh, The Practical MD is my online social media presence. I have a show called The Monday Medical Message where I provide very uh, short evidence-based information that anyone can can pick up and implement um, the whole purpose of the practical MD is to provide uh, information that people that can be a primer to then have a deeper conversation with your provider. I kind of see uh, the point of it to be able to be in partnership with with the provider. Um, so I think one thing that is important that I want to mention to everyone who watches this video is the importance of not neglecting your health um, your medical conditions during this time. So, you know, we know people are still um, getting syphilis. We know that people have uncontrolled <laughs> blood pressure. We know that people have uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, we know that obesity, we know all of these things are still happening during this time, even with COVID-19. So what, what I encourage is, you know, to still maintain a relationship with a provider or still, if you need to start a relationship with a provider, um, you know, to, to call um, your, on your health plan, if you have a health plan or, or to research or to even reach out to one of us, you know, I would rather, you know, someone reach out to me and say, I need help connecting in than not to connect in and, and to neglect their health during this time. Uh, the last thing I will say is, you know, if you're having emergency symptoms, because I know that there are a lot of people who are having, having um, life-threatening symptoms at times that are delaying going into the emergency room, you know, go in. <laughs> and, and I know that's, that's probably one of those things that you would think is a no-brainer, but we do know that there are people who are, are having uh, life-threatening situations, you know, having chest pain and, you know, things that need to be evaluated and for fear aren't even going to an urgent care, you know, um, to, to get that assessed. So I um, just wanted to communicate that because I think it's important. Yeah, I think for me, um, I would say professionally to everybody out there for our communities, um, media, everybody else, do not be brainwashed into thinking that black communities are the only ones who don't want to, who don't trust this COVID-19 vaccine. Most of the anti-vaccine people are white people. And so I want people to understand that and not put the onus only on black people for quote, quote unquote conspiracy theories or being distrustful because we have somebody in the White House now that spins conspiracy theories on a daily basis. And the last time I checked, he wasn't black. And all these people that are saying that the COVID-19 virus is still, uh, the COVID-19 condition and the coronavirus is still a hoax, um, those are not majority black people that are saying that. So I want people to understand that part of it. And then on a personal level, I will say last night while I couldn't sleep, I was surfing YouTube and ran into one of, a video of one of my favorite songs from all time from the 1980s, Automatic by the Point of Sisters. Where where Ruth Corner <laughs> sings lead. And can I tell you, I'd never seen that video before, but if you were to check a playlist of mine from the 80s, 90s, until now, that song has been on repeat so many times in my life. And seeing the video of the three of them up there getting it gave me absolute life. So I want to leave this on, I'll, and I'll leave it to you, Michael, but I want to leave it on that note because if you haven't seen the video for the Pointer Sisters, Automatic, where Ruth Pointer sings lead, it will give you 80s life like never before. <laughs> yes. So check it out. down a Please. rabbit hole this morning with that. Please <laughs> check it out. Check out the Pointer Sisters and, and uh, rest in peace as well. Yes. Um, as so, Bonnie, yes, while Bonnie, you're on YouTube, check it out. Trust me, check out our other content as well, too, here on CMP TV. And follow us, like, comment, subscribe, all our social media Facebook, Instagram, at the counter narrative. Twitter at Building Desire. Once again, thank you, three gentlemen, for being here for another episode of Revolutionary Health. And to everybody else out there, please be safe, wear your mask, wash your hands.